It's World AIDS Day. So we have questions um, from lots of people across the Prime Global Network. I just want to ask you, can you recall your first patient and how does it feel when you meet a new patient now with four decades of research now, now behind you and behind the sector? So I graduated from medicine in Australia in 1986 and so of course didn't have anything really about HIV in it um, because the virus had only been uh, isolated in 1983 uh, after those cases in uh, 1982, 81. Um, so I knew nothing about it and I had my first sexual health job in the UK after I moved over here and met our first person who tested positive. And all we had in terms of, of knowledge was a couple of books that had been published, for example, by BMA Publishing, that were descriptions of the disease and a photo book of some of the manifestations of the disease. And so those were the manuals on which I, I worked to try and help the individual that uh, we diagnosed at that time, 1987, just mm -hmm. after the licensing of AZT. Was it frightening? Was it frightening to be a physician with not anything to give to a patient and no hope to give to them? Is that, is that how it felt then? Was it, was it, was it worrying and frightening? So in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, we had very, very limited treatment. So very commonly, people saw a diagnosis of HIV infection as an inevitable step towards becoming symptomatic, developing AIDS events mm -hmm. and then dying. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do as much as we could in terms of both prolonging the person's life, prolonging that, that person's life with quality, managing and preventing opportunistic infections, and then managing terminal care so that an individual also had quality of death as well as quality of life. Mm. So what's it like now? So if someone comes to you now, they're newly diagnosed with HIV, what kind of conversation do you now have with them? So we'll want to start them on treatment as promptly as possible. In fact, some people come into clinic and get their results positive and leave with a bottle of pills straight away, what we call test and treat. Because treatment is incredibly effective, we suppress the virus really very rapidly, uh, and as a result, an individual won't then transmit the virus on to others. Mm. So that approach of test and treat is very important. It also limits the lifetime exposure an individual may have to the virus, so that results in them being more likely to maintain good health throughout the rest of their life. The medications suppress the virus very effectively, so an individual potentially will have a normal life expectancy as a result of taking treatment. But of course, it involves taking a pill every day. There's even a model from Denmark that mathematically projected the life expectancy of people diagnosed with HIV in the current era suggesting they may actually live longer than what their life expectancy would be, which is predicated on the idea that's never been random, randomised to trial tested, is that the doctor has an effect on prolonging a person's because life. Because you're having regular health conversations. You're having regular health checks. You're empowering in the, the individual about health and wanting to, yeah. to look after their health. And so they get diagnosed with things sooner or they take action around their health to prevent them developing illnesses in the future because they're aware and counselled and empowered about those things. That's an incredible, the impact of the doctor. Yes. I'm so not, not, not going to want to test it in a randomised <laughs> trial just yet. But. Okay. I'm really fascinated by what you say about patient activation because something we are really pushing is the patient activation measure, which is something that can actually be used and it's parameters that are around regular health screens, healthy lifestyle, um, participating in health literacy. And um, what you've just described there is, is fascinating because you're describing when you have a regular interaction with, with the patients that you treat, that you are almost, well, you're looking to how you can activate their participation in, in the course of treatment. So how much of an impact have you seen patient engagement and patient education having on, on the patients that, that you work with? So going back to the early era of uh, HIV infection, and it's, there's just been at the National Theatre a revival of the normal heart by Larry Kramer, who was one of the first activists with HIV, uh, to, to, to encourage science to take a, a role. And when people were saying, don't forget about us, invest in HIV research 
and it, putting that pressure on the US government and subsequently on other governments around the world to do research around HIV, to seek treatments, to trial uh, potential active agents. And it's been activism from our patients that have, have got us to where we are now by uh, conjoling governments and cajoling pharmaceutical industry to get involved in creating treatments and being the first people to step up and say, I want to be part of this trial to help develop this, this new drug. What we do know is that patients in other therapeutic areas, they really like the social channels, but it's not quite the same for people um, with HIV using some of the social media channels, is it? So um, is there a difference between like, a digital stigma versus um, you know, everyday stigma? Do you, do you see any differences there? Do your patients talk to you about any of the channels or stigma that they, they use or sure. perceive? So, you know, because HIV affects every, every community that, that, that makes up Britain or makes up the world, um, there are different levels of stigma or experiences of stigma across those different communities. Within the, the gay community, the stigma around HIV has diminished very substantially. And we have uh, and some of the things that have helped that are prominent people within the gay community who are positive coming forward and saying, here I am living with HIV and I'm living well and I'm living my best life with HIV. Um, other communities that are more affected by HIV don't necessarily have those champions who come forward. And so that there's, and they often come from smaller communities within the UK where there may be greater stigma around that. And of course, some of the education programs that first occurred in the, the United Kingdom, I think we can all remember the Don't Die of Ignorance campaign, to a certain extent was quite a stigmatising campaign. Particularly, it's a bit fear mongering. Yeah, yeah. And particularly as you know, a, a good campaign that you'll know better than me would uh, begin with raising awareness and then follow through with education and prevention programs. And the program ended with just that Don't Die of Ignorance awareness raising and then didn't educate the British population about it in a way that would have been helpful in reducing stigma. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is that we often still see written in newspapers expressions like AIDS victims. Mm -hmm. And that kind of victim victimology doesn't serve the community well. Mm -hmm. And the newspapers don't have not realised that HIV has moved on from the 80s and 90s and is now people are living well with suppressed HIV with suppressed HIV that they won't transmit because once they're suppressed, they, they don't pass the virus on. Um, and the, the world of HIV has changed extraordinarily and, and the population hasn't been well educated about that. That's interesting. I mean, I, I think it's incredible that we've even got pre-exposure prophylaxis. And I know, you know, it's been around for a while now, so I'm, I'm playing catch up. Um, but the idea that we've actually got something that can prevent, it's not quite a vaccine, but it's pre-exposure prophylaxis. What, ha what influence has that had, do you think, on these communities, on these risk communities in terms of their behaviours? Because, of course, patient education and health education isn't just about what you do if you have an illness. It's around general healthy decisions. And, of course... With HIV, you know, safe sexual practice was always a key part of education. So what do you think has now happened now that we've got pre-exposure prophylaxis? Has that taken away a person's responsibility to be educated? Or has it just made it easier to have a discussion with people who are at risk? So with pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, Commonly, it's the person themselves who asks their healthcare provider to say, oh, okay. can you... So that's can, an activated patient me? then? So yeah. that's correct. And when you look across the United States, uh, looking particularly at men who have sex with men, the prescription is less commonly given to black and Hispanic men, even though those are the groups where one is seeing more seroconversions right. in the United States. And that's because often they're having less contact with healthcare providers and they're often... Um, less educated about getting information about PrEP and prevention and their healthcare providers are maybe less comfortable about talking about I want to give you an antiretroviral to prevent you from right. getting uh, infected. In the same way in the UK most of the PrEP is given to men who have sex with men uh, as a prevention and we have trouble reaching other communities mm -hmm. for PrEP. 
So as a result of PrEP, together with treatment as prevention, we have seen dramatic declines in the number of infections amongst men who have sex with men in the UK, whereas for other groups uh, that are also affected by HIV, we've seen relatively stable rates of new infection and new diagnosis. But is it still the case with, with people living with HIV that those, those communities are perhaps underrepresented? Is there still quite a vast health inequality? So when we look at the most recent figures from 2019 for infections in the UK, about half of the infections, say 55%, are amongst men who have sex with men, and the other half are predominantly from people of sub-Saharan African origin, although chances are they may have, they will have acquired HIV while living in the UK, not somebody that has come to the country with mm. the infection. So we're not reaching those communities optimally, um, and that there remains relatively greater amounts of stigma in those communities about getting diagnosed mm. and coming forward mm. uh, to, to get tested and get treated. Mm. So the people from those communities tend to be presenting later with HIV infection so that they've been infected for a while, mm. which may also mean they've been more at risk of passing the infection yeah. on to a, a yeah. partner, uh, etc. So it sounds as though you know we're 40 years into different kinds of treatments um, but there's still like a stratification of people who are benefiting from, benefiting from those treatments or in fact benefiting from patient activation, patient education. There's still, still work to do. I've got a question from Olivia, who's one of our um, prime patient team members. Daily medication regimens pose a stressful burden on people living with HIV. When do you think long-acting HIV medication could be routinely available? So just recently, we've had the first injectable treatments for HIV licensed, first of all in the United States and then in the EU and the UK. Um, they're available, the license in the US is currently for every four weeks um, and in Europe every four or eight weeks. Um, and they consist of two relatively large injections done intramuscularly into the deep intramuscular space of the buttocks. So they're a little intrusive at the time that you're having them, mm. but they then liberate you from taking pills for four to eight weeks. Mm. There's also interest in developing an injection for PrEP and some very good data to say that you can use one of those drugs that we use as treatment as a long-acting PrEP. So we very soon will have available the, uh, of injectable treatment. Now, it's not going to be for everyone, because of course we're commonly giving people six months of medication and then seeing them at that time, and people may, may not wish to come back and have an injection from a healthcare provider every four to eight weeks for treatment. And of course there are also various criteria about those in terms of whether they've had resistance to medications in the past, that the medications are not active against hepatitis B, and so therefore they have to be adequately vaccinated or not co-infected with hepatitis B. If we look at the direction of travel in, for example, female contraception, it started off being a pill every day and moved into an injectable every three months, and now we have implantable devices that last for up to three years at a time. We've also seen some of that direction of travel, for example, uh, in psychiatric medications that are available as depot injections. So a number of the companies have talked about how they can advance injectable medication or possibly also an infusible medication and potentially have an implant either for PrEP and or for treatment along the way. And of course, the advantage of implantable devices is that if you want to stop that treatment at any time, you can simply remove the implant. Mm. Um, whereas with injectables, once the drug's there, it's got to go through its half-life and be drained from the depot that it's been placed into. So often you have a very long tail of medication uh, that may not necessarily be ideal. So we're moving into an era where some people will start accessing injectable treatment. They're probably not going to be for everyone, but they're certainly going to represent an, an option for people. And for example, if somebody's traveling and may not want to take pills with them when they're traveling, it may also represent an option for people to have a break and have something on board to manage their HIV while they're traveling and not have the burden of, of traveling with bottles of pills.